Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Simon. Hello. Hey, there. how's it going? So Simon, for the folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? As you uh, gather from my mellifluous accent, uh, I'm, uh, I'm based in the UK. I'm now a two times MVP based up in the north of England in Yorkshire, for those that uh, really want to know. Um, and what do I do? Well, actually, I'm retired, which is a remarkable thing. Um, Wait, but, are you, uh, is it retired yeah. with air quotes? Or yeah, you, or yeah, you know how actually that goes. Yeah, okay. yeah, it just means I actually work really hard, but don't get paid for it these days. Um, <laughs> but I've had two companies, all tech companies. Uh, yeah. I started my first Cloud 2 getting on for 15 years ago. Yeah, maybe it is 15 years ago. And that was uh, uh, that was uh, a SharePoint consultancy. But we think we were the first company in the world to actually do an, a so-called in-the-box uh, SharePoint solution. Um, so that's how we cut our teeth. Uh, so I, I, you know, I started my career in SharePoint and SharePoint Saturdays and all that, uh, yep. all, all that community activity there. Um, it's probably where I met you originally, uh, Christian, in one of I those. I think so. Of, uh, I, I think, uh, was it Nottingham or one of the London ones or? Could, could be any, yeah. any of the above. I was right. yeah, in the crowd and then eventually on stage at uh, a lot of them. Yep. Well, that's, that's cool. So, so uh, you you have, and you just started something else up. So what's your other project? So you mentioned, because you did one, I was interested because you so you got the SharePoint one, which you got that shared background, but you also did one that was in the healthcare space. Yeah, it actually effectively it spun out of, um, it spun out of uh, Cloud2. Uh, Microsoft came to us with this great idea that they thought was a, uh, a SharePoint solution. Um, I'll get into the detail. Uh, that lets... GPs or other healthcare professionals get expert advice from consultants or specialists as an alternative to sending people to hospital. Yeah. The, the good old Microsoft Health team thought, that's be a great SharePoint solution. It just wasn't. It was actually much more like an office communication server solution. And that's what we originally built it in. And then we threw that technology away. It, it, it couldn't quite do what we needed it to do. And we built a bespoke uh, platform, proper platform for doing these uh, advice and guidance uh, consultations. Um, we're actually, I'm coming to the end of that now, but over the course of the last eight to nine years that I've been running that company, we've stopped 80,000 patients going to hospital. Wow. So I'm quite well, proud of that. It's been a lovely know, business. So uh, I think that's just as a side note, very exciting. So I'm actually a an advisor for a startup that I met through as a regional director through the mentoring program, through the Microsoft for Startups program, mm. that's in that that space. They've got a platform that they've built there. It's growing very quickly in the U.S., but that's a, I mean, this is a completely different topic. And my daughter's in healthcare, so I am have a little more passion around this topic. We talk all the time about how to fix healthcare and the, the yeah, yeah. astronomical costs here in the U.S. And yep. so one of the things being able to do, uh, you know, to, to kind of pool your 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 doctors your help and the guidance and and almost add the community layer to help each other as preventative medicine like i don't know why we've not been doing this you know before and so it's it's taking off i i should introduce you to the to kike the founder of that company oh man we could do a whole podcast series just on this i tell you yeah, yeah. I mean, oh yeah no it's a great space you can't write my opinions on this on the back of an envelope. You know, you'll need a, you'll need a big book. But yeah, we should talk about that more. That would be very interesting. And I'm always happy to help because I'm retired. I have free time now, free time to um, to go and help uh, again other startups and anybody that uh, can pick uh, you know pick from my knowledge. I've spent basically all my career one way or another in the in the uh, the health health industry. I was um, in the medical device industry before getting into tech. And at one point I was in the probably the top 50 or so wound care experts in the world. So, well, that's, yeah, that's, that's an interesting conversation to have. No, that's that's another again. I know a little bit about this space because, again, former business partner who's now actually a patent attorney. He was uh, ran the uh, IP team at Google and also at Uber. And he's now yep. uh, with a, with a law firm doing that. But he started also in the medical devices uh, was uh, so Dr. Michael Meehan, who was at Stanford. Is that oh, OK? Yeah, there you go. Patent. Yeah. Uh, patent for medical device. Uh, uh, so, yeah, he, so he he started that space. It's funny. He would did his I think he did his in like 
AI and neural networks, his actual PhD, but his master's, I'm getting probably me messing it all up if Michael ever watches this, but, um, you know, but, but you know, got into that, the, the IP side of things. No, it's, it's interesting though. Um, you know, one, I think you can say about technologists, uh, you know, sometimes I look at like family members will ask me, it's like, well, you've kind of gone between different industries. I said, yeah, but I've always been in tech and the yeah. things that I have done for those companies in product and program management roles. And eventually as an evangelist, I'm, I'm it's funny, my undergrad is in marketing, my and then I've got an MBA. And yet, only until the last few years have I truly had a marketing role. You know, so. It, I, it's I, funny, isn't it? I mean, my undergraduate degree is in physics, uh, physics and chemistry, actually. Uh, and my postgrad is in, in physics and chemistry as well. But yeah, I also would say I've always been in tech. It's not always been in computing tech, you know, but, but in the broader, you know, the broader technology space, it's always been what I've worked on. And, uh, you know, currently, information technology in its various guises is a really good set of tools for addressing the world's problems. Um, so I'm using a lot of that at the moment, but it's not just about, you know, uh, uh, binary stuff. It's, it's all the physical stuff that comes out of that. Yeah. Um, there's some stuff I'm actually talking to a, a startup in the UK at the moment about how do we give AIs, because everyone's writing about that, me included, but how do we give AIs that ability to interact with the world? And of course, that's robotics. And there's some interesting stuff going on to be able to make it easier for people who are developers and coders, but don't want to learn about robotics to be able to interact with robots through a common, uh, a common framework. So, uh, so that's a whole conversation as well. Um, well, that's, I'm yeah, that's, a... that's interesting. I, you know, from in parallel to that, sorry, folks, we're going to get really nerdy here, yeah, yeah. but worked for years in the manufacturing sector, high tech manufacturing, where we were doing something uh, very similar. Um, we were leveraging, trying to build common uh, 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 you know, language using XML to communicate between these disparate you know, yep. manufacturing platforms with kind of, to be able to, to, to kind of create this, uh, um, you know, the, this, this communication hub across all of them. So it didn't matter what you went, if you had proprietary language, a proprietary system, but you could still you know, go to this service hub and communicate with all of the other platforms and systems and tools that you needed. And you just need something similar. You need to abstract yeah. that out for yeah. robotics so that you can plug in, do whatever you want, proprietary, the AI models, yet have a common way in communicating. Exactly. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you couldn't do that with printers. You know, the, the early computers, you actually you, you had to directly interact with the printer's you know, yep. drivers where and then windows etc come along and actually abstract you just talk to windows it talks to them. well that, that's that, what we need to do yeah that plug and play which never a hundred percent worked and certainly doesn't pray. work anymore yep, yep. We're almost moving backwards well. yeah. yeah but it's really interesting one of the blogs i wrote you know uh, probably in last month or something you know talking about why people shouldn't be afraid of ai and i list a bunch of reasons why you shouldn't be frightened of the uh, the skynet scenarios and one of them is AIs have no agency. And here I am now, a couple of weeks later, talking to a robotics company about giving AIs agency. But the really interesting thing they said was, oh, that's an easy problem to solve. We just physically prevent the robot being able to do bad things, even if the AI tells it to. And you can do that. You can build physical sensors into robots or stop them, you know, smacking somebody across the head with their metal arm, even if it's told to. Yeah, you know, I've got a, a simple solution. Uh, as we build out um, the tools that this uh, that the robotics can can use these artificial life forms, um, we don't add an option to the list of games, chess, Stratego. We don't add global thermonuclear war as an option. I yeah, think I we think solve a cool. lot of problems yeah, 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 yeah. adding that to the menu that the robot can select from. I, I, yes. That's me. Yeah. yeah. It seems, <laughs> seems like a reasonably uh, sensible approach, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, so I, I always like that. So you were, you've been in the space long enough. Um, what was your path to becoming an MVP? Why did it take yeah. so long for, for somebody well, that's been so involved in creating the company doing things? Because what was your, what was your path? Well, I guess it's because it never occurred to me that I could or should be one. I mean, I'm not, 
I'm clearly in the technical space, but I don't write code, I don't build servers, I'm more of an information architect. And my particular skill set has always been understanding the technology and how it interacts with business. And that's mm -hmm. that's always been my space. Um, but then uh, another MVP, uh, Simon Doy and I, uh, amongst others, have been running what's now the M365 North user group in the UK. And we've been running that for nine years now. And we just did that because it seemed like a really cool thing to do and there needed to be one in our in our region um and so i've been doing that and then through that we got uh, involved with mark anderson et al uh, and got sort of into doing this um uh, maturity model for microsoft 365 yep. we've done a lot of work on that and it's really potent stuff it's changed the way i think about business as well as tech um and so we were at um we were at the European um, Collaboration Summit a couple of years back, uh, the first one post uh, pandemic that we could go to. And uh, we were chatting with yet another Simon, because there are loads of Simons uh, in the MVP world, um, uh, Simon Agrin, uh, about this stuff. And I'd already done some work with him about how they could adopt the, the maturity model. He went, so how long have you been an MVP? I went, I'm not. He went, well, you should be. And the following day, he um, recommended me. And it was kind of like that. And so then you do, you know what it's like, you do all the, the Microsoft stuff to, yeah. to, to prove that you're as good as the recommendation. And um, I guess it was probably April or something last year that I got my uh, MVP and I was absolutely thrilled. And I'd never sought it. And I think one of the measures of probably a great MVP is they don't be, do it to become an MVP. They do the community work because they want to do the community work. And suddenly somebody says, here's an MVP. Yeah. You know, well, it, it, exactly it, it, it's a reward it's the icing yeah. on the cake it's not the it's not the cake it's yeah, yeah and, and and i think you find that and microsoft does a good job i think of sniffing that out from people that are trying to become mvps but aren't doing it for the right reasons you know like the, they're yeah. changing their behaviors rather than recognizing the behaviors that already exist yeah and I think that's a great model. I mean, I, again, I'm thrilled to have been nominated and then, you know, and then be, you know, reapproved, you know, in my second year. But I think what's what's probably most valuable is as an MVP, I then get to be asked to do stuff or can get people like you to come onto our events in a way that we couldn't when we weren't MVPs. So we can actually use it to leverage more community activity, which I think is great. Um, it also means I get to go and talk at a lot of conferences, and I love yeah. that. So. Well, that's, and that's something to be said for for folks that are not MVPs and and looking at how do I get more people to join our user group or to participate. We want to schedule an event. We want to get started. It's like, well, one of the ways you can do that is go find your local MVPs, get to know people in the community, get involved, and yeah. that's how things evolve. I had the same thing where for you know a couple of years I was the chief evangelist for the software company, for this ISV partner in the ecosystem. I was speaking at events. I mean, thankfully I had a, I worked for a company that recognized the value of the community activities that, that I was never in a sales. In fact, I've been in, this is my first sales role here this year in my lifetime mm -hmm. um, where I've got a number, you know, based on something, but I'm on the partner side, not in direct sales. Um, but you know, for all that that time, it was you know it was never expected. Okay, Christian's going to go speak at that event, and from that event, from Christian's activities, we'll have this many leads and this many you know customer. Yeah. Like like I never thought about that. I was there purely to talk about the technology, to be an yeah. advocate for my company's technology, to talk about you know the art of what's possible, to help identify gaps and whether people could fill those gaps themselves or my company's products can help fill those gaps. I mean, th those are the conversations that came out of that, but I was just always very neutral talking about technology. And, and, and so, and look, you can be biased. You can be, there are plenty of MVPs that all that they do is talk about their company's products and, and services, and that's fine. Um, but contributions are primarily neutral. So yeah. there has to be stuff that you're doing that is, in fact, there are MVPs who lost their MVPs because their only output was for their company blog about their products and services. Yeah. And that stuff doesn't count. Yep, quite rightly too. Yeah, I, I was never very good at, uh, at directly um, 
promoting my own company's stuff. It's probably why I'm not a millionaire, but hey, um, um, yeah, I'm still retired, so it's not gone too badly. But no, I think it's really important that people need to be honest and and educational. Um, you know, I think one of my great heroes as a physicist uh, is Richard Feynman. And if you don't know Richard Feynman, go and look him up, a remarkable American physicist. Uh, but he was a remarkable educator, and there's a lot to learn from people who who whose passion is transferring knowledge to others so they can carry the, the torch further than you can run. Yes, yeah, it's, it's funny. As you said that, and my, I thought of, you know, one of my, so I started as a, a my first major was industrial design. So I always have the design in the back of my wife just actually graduated here uh, after, you know, 30 plus years of marriage, finally went and finished her degree um, in the degree program that I started in. At the beginning of my, which I ended up leaving after three years, she went and got a design degree at the same university. But uh, I, I had a professor who I hated him when he was my professor was grading my work. But once I had that relationship, you know, we became really good friends, kept in touch years later, went back and visited campus. And he was very much about, let me show you this cool thing. And um, I don't know if you've seen like the, um, the new... Uh, 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 um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Indiana Jones movie. Yeah, so, so you know his sense. office that had like the aisles with all the artifacts. Yeah, um, uh, Professor Sindrich had a similar office, racks of stuff, but it was design stuff and books. But you walk through to the back, past these rows, to get to where his little desk was. But he had all these design you know, elements, artifacts yeah. around him. He was very much like a design, you know, architect or, or, or archaeologist. Yeah. Um, but that that kind of passion, I mean, that that really instilled in me that I, that that idea of learning about the pieces. Sometimes they, they, they don't always fit. You don't know how they'll they'll fit together. But it's amazing how my interest in technology broadly, how that's led again to these similar roles, but in very different technology areas. And that, but that they as they kind of come together, it's. You know, I got involved in knowledge management information systems in the early 90s. Yep. And so many of the issues working with IBM and HP technologies, and then not even getting into Microsoft technology, the enterprise side until I had personal computers, but uh, into until the, uh, uh, you know, 2005, you know, that that was a, it was a big shift. But so much of what I learned and what I you know, built my career on was relevant to everything yeah. that we're doing today. Yeah, there's there's a, a skill to managing information and knowledge that, that you know, you can intuit your way through what we taught, but yeah, but it's a really important skill. Um, I think the first the first intranet I built was um, was for the medical big international medical device company, and that was built in Lotus Domino and Notes. So. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It goes back away though. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hey, it was powerful in what it what it did. It's one of the reasons why. I mean, if you look at the path again, all the things that they, they did, the huge influence that Ray Ozzy had coming over to Microsoft led to so many of the different pieces. I think it would have never happened had it not taken that path. With, yeah. I mean, I, I discovered Groove when he launched that, when he split off and did that. Yeah. That was during yeah. while I was working on my MBA. We were using an FTP server to share files, to communicate with each other. And then suddenly we switched over to using Groove and doing like modern collaboration, video chats, um, yeah. you know, all of the, the social tools as well as the file collaboration, which evolved into you know, it influenced Everything you've SharePoint. Got today. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Remarkable. I and mean, yeah, we, we kind of take that for granted. But yeah, you and I remember a world where that just didn't exist. Yeah. It's, yeah, these kids these days, they have no idea. I know. <laughs> yeah. They still got to use email. What's that about? Yeah. No, it, it, it's funny. I, I love, uh, I shared once one time, but my, my daughter who was born in 92, and I don't know why this was, was, we were doing a trip from California, driving across Nevada to Utah. And uh, I remember we stopped at a gas station and my daughter is like pointing out across to this desert behind this gas station out this, this, this lonely stop. She's like, what is that over there? I'm like, what, what's what? And I'm peering off and like, 
what what are you looking at she's like right there i'm like where is it behind is it behind the pay phones she's like the pay what yeah it's like what yeah. is that i'm like what do you mean what that is it's a, it's a phone she's like why don't people just use their cell phones yep. you know so that's yeah it it's funny it's like i was like you're you're not that young it's like you've seen a pay phone before she's like nope and it, and it made me then look when we back went back home and there were i, I just i thought i could have sworn there were pay phones outside the grocery store nope yeah. nothing at the school like there's all of it was already gone so she just had no clue what that thing was so yeah, all of the uh, all of the you know, the classic British red telephone boxes in the UK, most of them are still there, but they're all either defibrillator stations or they've been turned into community book exchanges. Oh, really? I I thought it was just there for people for American tourists to yeah, take it, selfies. Yeah, they, they kept them mostly for Americans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Simon, really appreciate your time and and, uh, and talking. I'm I'm sure I'll see you once or twice more this year. You're going to be at ESPC. I'm not, but there is a chance I might be at North American Summit come April. Oh, okay. So, um, so yeah. if you'd like to be down in Texas, then uh, that's where I'll probably I'll, I'll, be. I'll definitely be there. I'm, I'm helping on the coordination side for that. So okay, I'll well, I know Don very well. So, um, ah, so I, yeah. I, th I think we've got, a, we've got a, a sneaky plan. So chances are I'll be there. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so, well, very excited. So I, I'm excited to see that move and to grow and stuff. So for those that don't know what we're talking about, the North American Collaboration Summit, which is the first week in april next year in 2024 down in the yeah. dallas fort worth area first, second week i'm not quite yeah. sure last time i spoke to don somewhere early there, early uh, april yeah. yeah sometime around the eclipse so a really good time to oh be. Yeah, okay. yeah really i think the eclipse is on the 8th or the 13th or something it's gonna reach down that that oh that yeah all something. the way along the western seaboard okay all right well well i'm sure there'll be a watch party so well, thanks. Yep. And for folks that uh, is a, uh, folks that want to connect with you, reach out to you. Where are you most active in the socials? Where can people find you? Oh, I mean, you can easily find me on LinkedIn, of course. Um, uh, Simon J. Hudson on Twitter or whatever it's called this week. I'm still going to call it Twitter. Twix. Yeah, I, I just, Twix. Yeah, whatever. Uh, but Simon J. Hudson on there or just Google me or Bing me. Bing chat. You'll find me on Bing chat. Oh, there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Simon. Yeah. Pleasure, Christian. Next time. Wow!